Today is the day. It was those four simple words that sealed Sean Kingy's fate. Sean Kingy was a beautiful 12 year old girl riding her yellow 10 speed bicycle home from school in Noosa Heads, Australia after shopping with her mother when she was abducted, raped and murdered by Barry John Watts and Val May Fay Beck. Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. If at any time you feel like you need support, please contact your local crisis centre. This episode involves a crime against a child. It may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Finishing up school on a sunny Friday afternoon on November 27th, 1987, Sean Kingy was excited about attending a school friend's upcoming birthday party. Sean's mum Linda agreed to meet Sean after school so that they could shop for fabric for a new dress. Linda and Sean picked out some fabric and finished their shopping at Noosa Fair Shopping Centre at about 4.30pm before heading home. Linda took her car and Sean cycled on her beloved yellow bike. Their home was only one kilometre away. Even though the two took different routes home, they were expected to arrive within minutes of each other. Sean's route took her through a local Noosa park called Pinaroo Park. But when Sean didn't arrive home shortly after Linda, Linda presumed she had met with friends and was chatting and was just delayed. But as the day went on and there were no signs of Sean arriving home, Linda started to worry. Linda started calling Sean's friends without success. Sean's father, Barry Kingy, arrived home from work just after 8pm and started the search for his daughter. The couple decided to retrace the steps of their daughter's return trip home from the shopping centre. They shone the headlight of their car into Pinaroo Park and found Sean's yellow bicycle lying in the grass. Sean's parents instantly knew something was terribly wrong. They loaded Sean's bicycle into the back of their vehicle and immediately alerted the Noosa police to her disappearance. Detective Sergeant Bob Atkinson knew Sean Kingy by sight. Sean played in the same netball league as his own daughter, so when Sean's parents came into the Noosa police station to report her missing, he didn't delay. Atkinson went with Sean's parents to Pinaroo Park, where the bike was located to search for clues, but nothing else was found at the scene. After inquiring as to whether Sean would run away, the Kingies told Atkinson their daughter would never do such a thing. She just wasn't that sort of kid. Noosa police acted immediately. They called the night desk of the local newspaper, the Sunshine Coast Daily, to print a notice about Sean's disappearance in the following day's issue. Sean Kingy was officially declared a missing person. By the morning of the 28th of November, every available police officer on the Sunshine Coast was on the lookout for Sean. Despite widespread reporting of Sean's disappearance, the police had little to go on. There was a sighting of a dust-covered white Holden station wagon, but without any registration details and over 10,000 white station wagons registered on the Sunshine Coast, it was almost impossible to find a suspect. That evening, Sean's disappearance was on all the television news channels. Three days after Sean's disappearance and with no solid leads, Noosa police called on the homicide squad from Brisbane to assist. A command centre was set up in Noosa and manned around the clock. Over 700 leads came in regarding Sean's disappearance, but the only consistent lead was the sighting of the dusty white Holden station wagon with a scruffy looking man and a heavy set woman. Five days after Sean's disappearance, 18 year old fruit picker Neil Clark was walking home from his work near Castaways Creek in the Timbeerway Mountain State Forest when he noticed a foul odour. He took note of the smell and decided if it was lingering the next morning, he would check it out. The smell was still strong the next day, so Neil followed the source of the stench. There, he found the body of a young girl in a blue and white striped dress. He called Noosa police right away. Detective Sergeant Bob Atkinson took the call at the Noosa Command Centre 
and together with Senior Sergeant Bob Dallow from the Brisbane Homicide Unit, they investigated Neil Clark's discovery. Sean was found still dressed in her Sunshine Beach school uniform. Her underwear had been cut off and was located nearby, as was her green school backpack. Sean had been stabbed 12 times, including two deep wounds to her neck. She had also been sexually assaulted and strangled. Five days after Sean was found, a private service was held on her family's Sunshine Coast property. She was sent off with a traditional Maori farewell. Detective Sergeant Bob Atkinson and members of the Brisbane Homicide Squad took time out of the murder investigation to attend Sean's farewell and pay their respects. Shocked residents of Noosa raised over $10,000 for a reward to find Sean's killers and police launched a nationwide manhunt. The only concrete lead police had was the sighting of a dusty white Holden Kingswood station wagon. Police made a statement to the media for any person who saw this vehicle in the vicinity of Pinaru Park, Noosa on the 27th of November 1987. A member of the public came forward with a sighting of a Holden Kingswood station wagon on the day of Sean's murder. The woman, Elizabeth Young, told a story about a strange encounter with a man who drove the White Holden. Elizabeth and her friend Bill Wallace were swimming at Castaways Beach, 11 kilometers south of Noosa, when they noticed an unshaven man walking along the beach. The woman noticed him as he appeared to be searching for something in the sand dunes. The man was unkempt and looked homeless. Elizabeth thought she had seen the man the day before and recognized him, so she waved at him. The man just glared back at her. Bill Wallace had previously had trouble with people breaking into his vehicle and was wary of the strange man. So he and Elizabeth got out of the water and went back to their vehicle to check. Their car was fine, but they did notice the man jump into a White Holden Kingswood station wagon and drive away. The couple had an uneasy feeling about the man on the beach and what he might have been doing. So Bill wrote down the car registration details. The registration was LLE 429. The vehicle was registered in Victoria to Val May Fay Beck. Noosa police called the Victorian police to attend the address where the vehicle was registered. Police knocked on the door at the address. The door was answered by an elderly man called Ronald Watts. Ronald told police that his son Barry was married to Val May Beck. Police had their suspects. Now they just needed to find them. Barry Watts and Val May Beck were wanted in Western Australia but had skipped bail and absconded to Queensland. On speaking with Western Australia police about the couple, Noosa police requested photographs of the two. They express posted photographs of the pair to the Noosa CIB, Criminal Investigation Bureau. Those close to Sean all described her in the same way. Happy, sweet, innocent, and most of all, kind. It was these beautiful traits that sadly would make her the perfect target. As she confidently rode through the park, eager to beat her mum home, Sean was approached by a distraught woman calling out for her dog. A lover of animals, Sean sympathised with the woman when she asked for help to find her beloved white poodle wearing a pink bow. It was this split second decision made from the goodness of a little girl's heart that cost the 12 year old her life. Just moments later, Barry Watts sneaked up behind Sean and grabbed her before throwing her into his station wagon. Taping the terrified little girl's hands and mouth, the couple drove 12 kilometers to Tin Biwa Forest. It is there that Watts repeatedly raped Sean. He then stabbed her 12 times in the chest before cutting her throat. Then, as if nothing had ever happened, the couple dumped her remains and went home to enjoy the rest of their evening on the couch watching television. Today is the day. These words were uttered by sadistic child killer Barry Watts to his wife, Val May Beck, that day in 1987, 
when they were trawling Noosa looking for a victim. They had driven north from their home in Ipswich to the sunny beaches of the Sunshine Coast, sure that young girls would be out enjoying the water and sunshine. Val May Beck was a 41-year-old, twice-divorced mother of six. She had an extensive criminal history with charges for theft, indecent behaviour, obtaining money under false pretenses, forgery and vagrancy. She had served time in a Perth prison where she befriended Perth serial killer Catherine Burney. All of Val May's children had been either taken off her for neglect or were being raised by their respective fathers. Her husband, Barry John Watts, was 10 years younger than Beck. Watts, 31, was a petty criminal working as a doorman at a Perth tavern when the couple met in 1983. Watts was part Aboriginal and covered in tattoos. He was an orphan who had a long criminal history. Not long after meeting, Watts was imprisoned for a break and enter charge and was put in jail for two and a half years. It wasn't Watts' first time in trouble with police. He had previously been charged with armed robbery and theft. On Watts' release in July 1986, Val May and Beck moved in together. They married in December 1986 and Val May took Watts' birth name, Beck. The first few months of their marriage were relatively uneventful. Watts had promised Beck that he would remain on the straight and narrow and would stay out of prison. But then he started beating Beck. Watts demanded that Val May dye her hair blonde and insisted she wear a school uniform. During this time, Watts also resumed his former criminal activities. But instead of kicking him out of their home, Beck assisted her husband by becoming the lookout. The couple were caught and charged with stealing and other fraud offences. When they were released on bail, the couple fled to Queensland and stayed at Beck's sister's home in Ipswich before renting a house at Lowood, west of Brisbane. It was this period that Beck calls a friend in Perth, telling her, quote, Barry is at it again. He was going down to the school bus stop, just down the road, and was perving at the schoolgirls. The couple fought constantly over Watts' fantasies about schoolgirls. Watts told Beck that if she valued their marriage and if she loved him, she would help him get rid of his aggression by having sex with a virgin, preferably a petite girl with fair hair. Then he would never look at another woman in his life. Beck was terrified of losing her much younger husband, so she agreed. On the 29th of October, 1987, just one month before Sean's abduction and murder, 31-year-old student teacher Helen Feeney disappeared from the car park of Castle Dean College in Brisbane. Helen was a very petite woman with light-coloured hair. Her white Holden Gemini sedan was found with its window smashed. Although Helen's body has never been found, it is believed that Helen Feeney was killed by Barry Watts and her body was disposed of at the Lowood rubbish tip. Beck would later testify that Barry Watts killed Helen Feeney, but no charges were laid against Watts due to lack of evidence. On the 11th of November, 1987, Beck and Watts attempted to kidnap an employee from Target at Knife Point in the car park of the Bouville Fair shopping centre in Ipswich. 24-year-old retail assistant Cheryl Mortimer had left for the day and was leaving the centre car park in her car when Beck approached Cheryl to ask for directions. Watts came up from behind Beck and threatened the woman with a knife before attempting to drag her out of her vehicle and into theirs, a white Holden station wagon. The woman put up a fight and managed to escape. Watts cut his hand with his knife during the scuffle and left bloody fingerprints all over Cheryl's vehicle. One of Cheryl's colleagues approached to assist in the scuffle and the couple left in a hurry. Cheryl immediately reported the incident to police, including the vehicle registration number. But when police investigated, they found that the registration did not match that of a Holden station wagon. Police kept the fingerprints on file and ran a notice in the local Ipswich newspaper regarding the incident. 
After publication, two Ipswich nurses reported frightening incidents involving a white Holden station wagon with out-of-state plates. Both incidents occurred late at night in the car park of the local hospital when the women were leaving work. In one incident, a man banged on the roof of the nurse's vehicle, giving the woman a fright. She hurriedly left the scene. The other incident involved a man asking for directions with a map. The nurse noticed ropes and bags in the back of the man's vehicle. She was soon saved by another hospital employee who came to investigate. Police could not find the vehicle or locate the owners, but when they read about Little Sean's abduction that involved a White Holden Kingswood station wagon, they picked up the phone and called the Noosa CIB. After murdering Sean Kingy, Val May Beck and Barry Watts saw the huge media outrage on television and immediately went on the run. Val May dyed her hair and the couple fled to Melbourne and sold the White Holden Kingswood. Police tracked the couple to the Lowood residence, but the couple were gone. Inside the home, they found discarded used hair dye and cut hair that indicated that the pair had changed their appearance. The owner of the Lowood property contacted the police the very next day when they received a money order from a couple with an address in New South Wales. Immediately, police swarmed the address and the couple were arrested on the 14th of December 1987 and charged with Sean Kingy's murder. During questioning, Barry Watts refused to speak or to even confirm his identity, but Val May Beck was more forthcoming. Val May Beck told the police that her husband was unsatisfied with her. Barry Watts was 10 years younger than his wife and had fantasies about raping a young virgin. Val May Beck admitted her part and pleaded guilty to the abduction and rape, but not the murder of Sean Kingy. The murder sparked anger across the country. Outraged locals pelted rocks at the couple during their first appearance at the Noosa Magistrates Court and many demanded the return of the death penalty. Val May Beck was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison in October 1988. Beck was extradited from New South Wales days before what would have been Sean's 13th birthday and gave a detailed confession about the crime. She told the court that Sean, quote, never cried, never shed a tear. She was a brave little girl she never uttered a peep. She just did everything he told her. Barry Watts pleaded not guilty to all charges, but was found guilty of murder and was jailed for life in December 1990. Justice Kelly said Watts should never be released from prison or only be released on parole if he was of an age where he could not cause menace to young girls. It was not until a decade later that Barry Watts finally admitted to the rape, torture and murder of Sean Kingy. Val May Beck, who changed her name to Faye Cram, died in hospital in May 2008 after being transferred from Townsville Correctional Centre in Queensland, where she complained of shortness of breath. She underwent heart surgery and was placed into a coma, but never fully regained consciousness before passing away. Barry Watts, remains at Walston Correction Centre in Wakehall, Queensland. He made a controversial bid for freedom in 2021, but his application for parole was denied. In the aftermath of Watts' attempt at parole, a historical bill proposed to the Corrective Services Act was passed in 2021 in a bid to help keep the worst of the worst killers behind bars for longer. The amendment, dubbed Sean's Law, allows the President of the Parole Board of Queensland to make a declaration that a person convicted of murdering a child or murdering multiple people will be blocked from getting parole for up to 10 years beyond their eligibility date. Thank you for listening to this episode. This episode is dedicated to the memory of Sean Kingy, who would have just turned 49 years old. If you liked this episode, be sure to follow or subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media and check out our website, 
at shadowcrimes.com, where mysteries thrive and shadows speak. <laughs>